Okay, this is going to be the last one, I think, because my temperature is actually going up. I'm taking it between episodes of this. And it's up to 107. Or 100.7, not 107. I would be dead if it were 107. All right. Anyway, um, what I was talking about was the Azande and this idea of social control. And Bowen talks about this to a certain extent in his discussion of witchcraft in Salem. And um, basically, I won't go into a lot of details here because I'm running out of steam, but you have the um, two families, the Putnams and, well, you can supply it. You read the article. It'll come to me later. Porters? I think it was the Putnams and the Porters. Anyway, um, how a lot of the victims in the Salem, Massachusetts community who were accused of witchcraft and jailed or killed um, were enemies of one of the families that uh, had more power. And the, uh, or I'm sorry, friends, friends with the family that had more power. Basically, one of the arguments that is made by some people studying this, including Bowen, is that here you have these two rich families, or one rich family and their enemies in Salem, Massachusetts. How do you strike at the people who have the money? You go ahead and you um, single out people who are close to them, who aren't powerful enough themselves to strike back, but you can hit them and hurt the major family because of the relationship between those people and that family. Hope this is making sense. Another argument that's been made is that the girls were faking this, they were interested in the attention, and you have kind of a, a mania that travels through people. And we've seen this even recently in the United States um, in the 1990s, for instance, early 1990s, late 80s. And um, Johnson talks about this. There was this horrible fear of Satanism. And people who worked in state governments, county governments, were told to be on the lookout for child sacrifices and baby sacrifices because Satanists were out doing these kinds of things. And so they would um, look for people who fit certain characteristics, kind of like a profiling. Well, what's a Satanist profile? Well, this is one of the interesting things for anthropologists, is that certain types of people get accused of witchcraft. They usually are women who are more powerful than that society would like, and so you can strike them back. But also liminal people, people who are a little weird, people who are handicapped, people who are elderly people who are on the fringes of society and aren't part of the mainstream popular crowd. And they're the ones that get singled out. Now, when I was in my early 20s, I actually worked in a jail as a booking clerk in San Diego, California. And one of the um, inmates at the jail was a guy named Dale Akiki. And he's actually even on Wikipedia. Dale Akiki was a hydrocephalic. His head was unusually large. He was a little on the strange side to look at. I'll say a lot on the strange side. The first time I saw him, I got in an elevator with him, and I was kind of, <gasps> but then I found out he was very much beloved among the jail population. I mean, the gang members in the jail would protect him if anybody tried anything. He was a daycare um, person for a church, and Satanism accusations had been leveled against him by parents of very young children, like pre-nursery pre, um, school, like one-year-old, two-year-old. and. Um, the argument was that he had sexually abused these children in some very violent ways, that he had um, sacrificed animals in the classroom. And so an investigation was done, and these children were interviewed by um, county officials who were prepped to be on the lookout for Satanism, because that was the trendy thing right then. And they asked questions, did he kill rabbits in the classroom? Yes. I mean, very little kids. You know, the kind, if anybody knows kids who are about that age, you ask them questions and they know that you're looking for a yes, they're going to say yes. Um, it kept going until people realized that according to the children, he had killed, I think, a giraffe in the classroom. Um, certainly babies had been killed. And one of the things that the defense eventually pointed out was none of these children showed any signs of physical harm. It is very hard to rape somebody with a foreign object and for them not a child and for them not to have any physical sign of this. So after a year and a half in jail, awaiting various trials, putting things off, he was finally exonerated and released. But really, the underlying understanding that people took away from it was he looked weird, therefore he was clearly an evil person and a Satanist. And this kind of thing goes around, this idea of a witch hunt, 
Um, you stand out in some way. You can be put in danger, especially if people are on alert for this kind of thing. Um, okay, so Johnson talks about um, also the idea of the creation of false memories. People who are supposedly victims of things that probably never occurred. Part of what we find um, is that when hypnosis was being done on people to bring out repressed memories of traumatic things that happened to them, and those of you who are you know, in psych classes are probably aware of this, you can give somebody, while they're suggestible, an idea, and upon awaking they will remember that idea as though it really happened. And so Johnson is making the argument that people who have been claimed to have been abducted by UFOs abused by Satanists, performed Satanist acts. Um, what does he throw in there too? He talks about Salem. That you could confess to something that you actually didn't do just because you were in a kind of trance-like state, whether through psychological hypnosis or through something else, and then you have that belief that you actually did that. Um, Johnson talks about a guy who uh, really thought that he had abused his daughters in satanic rituals, even though he initially denied it. And why does this happen? Why would people confess to something? Another thing that's important when thinking about the Salem witch trials is that the people who confessed generally lived, and the people who maintained their innocence generally died. If you said, yeah, I'm a witch, I can tell you about the other witches, then you can become useful. If you're stubborn and you say, no, I'm innocent, then that's the end of the story. Speaking of the end of the story, I know we haven't gotten to um, Wogan and his candle and um, San Lan Santo, oh gosh, now I can't even think of it, the witch saint that he talks about, and um, we haven't talked about Lazar, but we will next time. Watch the film, and I will see you all, I hope, later. Bye-bye.